of uh, the David Mednikoff, Chair of the Engagement and Outreach Committee for SPP, and I'm coming to you from um, Amherst, Mass, by way of Essaouira, Morocco. Um, so uh, I just want to say a quick thing about contextualizing um, this series and um, coming attractions, and then I'll, I'll, I'll introduce um, today's speaker who is near and dear to all of us at SPP. Um, so this year, um, the talks that we've been doing um, over this lunchtime have generally been um, around relevant issues that have to do with social justice and social policy. I mean, I think everybody, both students um, in our community and faculty have felt that it's, it's important that, you know, the, the, that we, we really think about things in broad contexts that have to do with issues around racial justice, around um, environmental justice, um, etc. And and I'm actually, you know, we couldn't have we couldn't have sort of planned it so that it worked out better. Um, the, the stuff that we're dealing with this semester by and large dovetails pretty nicely with the challenges that happen to be faced by a new presidential administration. So um, today um, my my wonderful new colleague um, Ethan Zuckerman is going to talk about um, social trust um, in which is obviously, you know, and dramatically and sadly, um, an issue that's on everybody's minds after um, recent events and something that's clearly significant to the Biden administration. Um, a month from now in March, um, another kind of local friend, um, Professor Jennifer Taub at Western New England Law School will talk about her book, Big Dirty Money. And, you know, this is another hot issue um, that her that the, with a book that addresses it in a very accessible and, and significant manner. Um, so she'll be talking about you know, corporate crime and, and how to police it. Uh, and finally, later in the semester in April, um, we will have a talk on environmental justice um, by a veteran policymaker in this field, um, Nikki Sheets. So, I mean, the, today is going to be great and the next couple of talks are going to be great as well. Um, as always, I want to welcome not only um, my friends and colleagues and students from the SPP community, um, but also um, people from UC Riverside um, public policy who are attending and, you know, anybody else. It's always lovely that Zoom allows us to have, you know, a wide reach for these kinds of things. And I'm delighted to see, you know, people far and near. Um, so uh, let me say something about the speaker and I'm going to say very little. Uh, I think we can put up in the chat a link to um, Professor Ethan Zuckerman's um, detailed and you know really supremely impressive biography and experience that inform what he's going to talk about today. Um, but Professor Zuckerman uh, has just started formally this semester as an associate professor of public policy communication and information. So he's in three different units and, and in two different colleges at the university. That's how much people want him um, to be engaged here. And um, he's the director of the UMass Institute for Digital Public Infrastructure, focusing on reimagining the internet as a tool for civic engagement. As I say, I could say a lot more and I'm not going to, um, other than we've just in the short time that Ethan's been in the community. I mean, I, I know I speak for many people in this Zoom. We've benefited enormously from his background, knowledge, expertise, generosity, and wisdom. And today will be no, um, will be no exception, I'm sure. So Ethan's talking about his new book that, that just came out, uh, I guess, a month ago called Mistrust, um, Why Losing Faith in Institutions Provides the Tools to Transform Them. Um, this is not, you know, this is a book with lots of intellectual depth, but is certainly very accessible. Um, and it's been reviewed by many outlets, including the New York Times Sunday Book Review. Um, so, you know, this is this is a big book getting lots of deserved attention and we're very grateful that um, Ethan's agreed to share contents of the book here. One quick thing before I turn it over. Um, again, our rules tend to be, you know, similar to sort of Zoom forum rules. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the chat. And then when Ethan's done talking, which will be about 30 minutes, 
we'll try to call on you to ask your question in the order that, that um, we see the, the questions in the chat. So please do that. Um, and without further ado, I'm turning it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Ethan Zuckerman. Well, David, thank you so much. And, and thanks everyone for, for coming out. I know that we're spending our entire lives these days on Zoom and I really appreciate everybody coming and spending a little bit more time uh, with me to, to talk about this book. Um, I think the first thing that I wanna tell you about this book is uh, just a reminder for, for everyone who's, who's written a book before, you really don't get any control over when they come out. Uh, you start working on a book five, seven years before it actually hits the press. And so when I started writing Mistrust, um, to be very, very clear, I was in no way thinking about Donald Trump. Uh, and the ways in which a Trump presidency uh, really weaponized mistrust. Uh, I would argue that Donald Trump um, used mistrust of government institutions as his chief selling point in his campaign. And then as we saw uh, just a couple of weeks ago, really tried to use that mistrust uh, to hold on to office by way of force. Uh, in a way that I think we're actually going to be processing and discussing for uh, many months or possibly years to come. And I, I'm hoping that that in the question and answer, we'll probably get to this notion of weaponized mistrust, synthetic mistrust, manufactured mistrust that's characterized the Trump era. Uh, but I actually wanted to talk about where this um, started for me. Uh, which was a very different protest movement. Uh, a lot of my work over the years has been in West Africa, specifically in Ghana, a country that's very near and dear to my heart. And um, six or seven years ago, there was a protest movement in Ghana called Dumsor. Dumsor is a, a Chui word that means on off. And what this basically was, was a consumer protest against uh, the lights going out. Uh, basically a weak electric grid that was designed when Ghana was a poorer nation and just isn't surviving now that more people have air conditioners and televisions and so on and so forth. And I wanted to talk specifically about this guy who's now uh, sitting over my head. This is my friend, Efo Dela. Um, he's a very active uh, writer, satirist, as well as a computer programmer in Accra. And I started following him because he was tweeting a great deal about these Dumsor protests. He'd gone out and helped organize a march that brought 5,000 people out into the streets. And I happened to be in Accra giving a workshop. He showed up at it. And in the workshop, I said, Efo, what are the technologies that people are using for political organizing in Ghana? Like, are you using Facebook or using Twitter? How do you get people out in the street? And Efo said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not political. Now, in some of the countries that I work in, some of the countries that David works in, I'm not political means shut up before I get arrested. But this is Ghana. Ghana is actually a more open society in some ways than the United States. You're not going to get arrested for political activism. What AFO actually meant, and he went on to explain, was that as a young Ghanaian, being involved with formal multi-party politics means you are an idiot. It means that you are interested in this game that has very low relevance to everyday life, that you are a political sort of person. And AFO went on to say, I'm not political. I won't even let someone political take a photo with me because I would lose all of my credibility. People would assume that I am playing that political game rather than uh, being an independent thinker involved with something like Dumsor. And I realized talking to AFO about this, that a lot of what I tend to think of as conventional civics was not working for the young people that I was working with in Ghana, in Sub-Saharan Africa, even in my classes at that point over at MIT. Even when we would talk about historic movements like the civil rights movement, and in this case, the March on Washington, Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, people would say, but it doesn't work like that anymore. And usually what happens when young people say that's not how civics works, we grownups sort of respond by saying, but you don't understand it, you just haven't had good enough civic education. And what I decided to do was to try to take seriously these young people 
who were saying to me, you don't get it. It doesn't work that way anymore. You can't bring everybody out into the streets and have a protest and see major social change coming out from it. Those levers don't move the same way that they used to. And so instead, what I started to try to think about is what might have changed in America and in the world between these moments where conventional political activism, conventional civic participation felt effective and the present moment. And the thing that I sort of stumbled upon is pretty well known, but I think not nearly well enough discussed. And it is a shift in trust and a shift specifically in trust in institutions. So let me distinguish for a moment here. Sociologists talk a lot about trust on an interpersonal basis. Um, they often use the world values survey to go out and say, is it okay to trust other people or you can never be too careful? Uh, and there's wide variance within that. It's fairly stable over time. The US is a little less trusting than it is now than it was say in the 1960s, but it's not a collapse. On the flip side, trust in institutions, specifically here trust in government, has cratered. In 1964, so the height of the, the civil rights movement, if you asked Americans, do you trust the government in Washington to do the right thing all or most of the time, 77% of them said yes. If you ask Americans that now, you're going to get about 17%. So we went from almost four in five to less than one in five. And I'm going to argue that that is a fairly massive social transformation. I'm also going to point out that it is not a new social transformation. Actually, lots of this happens through the 1970s. Uh, and for really good reasons, right? We've got Watergate, uh, we've got the Vietnam War, we've got an energy crisis, we have a decade that could just destroy public trust and confidence. What's interesting is we get down to 26% under Carter, a moment that I think a lot of people who lived through it would identify as a pretty low point for American self-image. There is recovery under Reagan, there's recovery under Clinton. We actually cross the 50% trust line just before the United States invades Iraq after 9-11, the rally around the flag effect, but then it's been a real slump since then. And frankly, we crossed the Carter line, the, the one in four having confidence in 2008, we haven't gotten back. Uh, we had very low confidence in government under Obama, we had very low confidence in government under Trump. I predict we will see similarly low confidence under Biden. If it were only government, that would be one thing, but it's not. What's really interesting is that when we look at a whole range of institutions, uh, the church, the medical system, the Supreme Court, public schools, organized labor, newspapers, television news, big business, and finally at the bottom of this, Congress, our trust has compressed significantly. There's only two areas where trust has increased from the 1980s. One is small business. I don't consider that an institution. I think small business is much more of you have a relationship with a person who has a face rather than a relationship with a bureaucracy. So cross that off for the moment. The one where we have seen increases is the military. And that's not necessarily good news. Seeing increased trust in the military at the expense of all other institutions, that's Egypt, right? Like that's not necessarily the outcome that we wanna see coming out of this. Some of these changes in confidence are catastrophic. We go from 80% of people trusting the medical system in 1975 to 37%. And that's an enormous shift and that has implications for things like COVID. This also isn't just the US. The US historically has been sort of in the middle of the pack on trust. The, that previous data, that's a variety of polls, including Pew and Gallup. This is a set of polling done by Edelman, which has been doing global trust tracking over a very long time. The last couple of years, they've broken it out to general population versus elites. You can see in general population, the US is, is in the low trust category, close to the middle, it's a little lower in the elites. Um, but there are significant advanced societies that are less trusting 
than the United States. Some are unsurprising. Russia is an incredibly low trust country, uh, but Japan, the UK, um, Spain, uh, those are at least for me surprises as far as many advanced democracies that are having significant problems with trust. This report, by the way, is brand new and it seems to actually have a lot to do with how people are dealing with COVID. Uh, and that is something that, that we can come back and talk about a little bit. Finally, one of the things I wrestle with early in, in the book is this new, relatively new paper um, uh, by Fo and Monk that came out in 2017 that suggests that in some societies, we're not just seeing mistrust, we're actually seeing doubts about the value and importance of democracy. The way to read these charts are that you see in the US, people born in the 1930s, 75% of them say that it's essential to live in a democracy. By the time you're getting to people born in the 1990s, it's down around 30%. So you seem to have a generational change in how people feel their enthusiasm for democratic systems. And this, what they're calling a deconsolidation of democracy, um, is incredibly worrisome. One thing that's wonderful to watch in this is uh, Ron Englehart, whose, whose data from the World Values Survey ends up being used to generate these charts, comes back and says, well, maybe we're seeing democratic uh, consolidation. The one place that it's very clear we are is in the US and the US is uniquely screwed up. Like it makes perfect sense that in the United States you would be seeing that sort of collapse in trust. So looking at this phenomenon, it's very much worth asking the question, what causes trust to fall? And this is a really complicated question because you've got to look all the way back to the 1970s. It can't just be something that's happening in the last five or six years. It can't just be Donald Trump. When you look at those long-term trends, education is one interesting possibility. You have in these advanced democracies, a much better educated population, a much larger set of critical thinkers. You have many more people finishing high school, going on to college, and they might simply be in a place to pick a part of these institutions and ask questions and not have as much credulity about them. You might have an effect, not just of the internet, which is really an effect in the last 10 years or so, but a shift in journalism we see a much more aggressive style of journalism in the United States starting with Watergate. Uh, and we see that sort of parallel shift. It's quite possible that between the internet, more aggressive journalism and the echo chambers of social media, that we are pulling apart social institutions in a very different way than we had, had done previously. I think inequality has a lot to do with this. This is another factor that lines up in time scale. Um, we shift between the 1960s and the 1970s in many advanced economies, notably the US and the UK, from a more redistributive economy into this more sort of neoliberal economy where we are shrinking the ambitions of government, we are shrinking the size of public services, and predictably what ends up resulting from this is that we are not redistributing money in the same way and we see rising and increasing inequality. And at a moment where inequality is making people's lives very difficult, you might well find people saying, I don't trust any of these systems. These systems are leaving me under a bridge. They're leaving my kids worth off, worse off than they were leaving me. I simply have lost faith. I think honestly, the most compelling argument in all of this is that institutional failure correlates really closely with loss of institutional trust. So remember, I said that we saw uh, confidence in the healthcare system drop from uh, about 80% in 1975 and is now down around 34%. Parallels the invention of HMOs. Uh, once people are no longer dealing with their family doctor, they're dealing with a large bureaucracy that often feels like it's trying to prevent them from having healthcare, trust ends up falling. Um, trust in big business and financial markets takes a huge hit in 2007, 2008, a real sense that these markets are not working for the average person. And this, which is of course lines for COVID testing, this is demonstrating a real stress test for institutions in nations all over the globe. Why do we care about mistrust? 
it affects our ability to respond to things like COVID, to respond to a crisis. Consider Taiwan. It's got 22 million people. It's 100 miles from China. Um, some huge percent of the population, about 5%, actually live in mainland China. Everybody expected Taiwan to have a huge battle with the disease. But in fact, Taiwan has had almost no cases, almost zero deaths, lots of celebration of, of zero cases. And this had a lot to do with a government response that was extremely aggressive and very well supported by the population. Take the flip side uh, where we've seen uh, the, the president of Brazil refer to the little flu and you've seen a massive wave of deaths uh, around Brazil, almost rivaling the massive wave of deaths that we've seen in the United States, which has also minimized COVID and which has also had very low confidence in a government response. But what I really wanted to write about was the ways in which mistrust can create a crisis for civics. And here's the thing, if you don't have very much confidence that your legislature can make change, that you're going to pass laws and those laws are going to make society better, it can actually be very hard to pull people out to the polls. It can be very hard to convince young people that getting involved with conventional politics is the way to go. At the same time, you can even have problems with protest because ultimately that 1963 photo of the March on Washington, that's a March on Washington. That's the civil rights movement pressuring the Kennedy administration to make major change around civil rights. And it reflects a certain amount of faith that Kennedy could in fact make change around civil rights. When you see, for instance, the protests in 2016 around Donald Trump's election, that protest isn't expecting to move Donald Trump on issues of women's rights. It's more an expression of anger an expression of rage. It's not instrumental in the same way that many of the protests that we have been taught about in the 1960s ended up being. So I worry that mistrust leads to powerful demagogues coming up and saying, the system doesn't work, just trust me. I'll help you through this. And if you follow me, we'll get through this. I worry that mistrust leads to disengagement. People looking at systems and saying, there's no way that I can have influence or impact. I'm just not going to bother. So when I wrote this book, I used a pair of terms that I did not expect to be quite as controversial as they are right now. You can imagine, uh, as everyone sort of agreed that we were going to talk about what happened on uh, January 6th as an insurrection, having a book that pivots on the term institutionalists and insurrectionists is a little tricky, but let me explain how I'm using them and how Chris Hayes, who coined these terms, is using them. Very simply put, institutionists believe that if you wanna make change in the world, you go out and join a strong institution and you try to steer it for the better. Insurrectionists say, wait a second, have you seen these institutions? You want me to join that thing? You gotta be kidding me. We either need a very different institution, no institution at all, we need to rip them down, we need to put something up in its place. And this book, is an exercise in trying to take the insurrectionists seriously. Are there institutions that are so badly broken that we need to look for a different way? Pull down that institution, put something else in its place. Now, there are insurrectionists on the right and on the left. A lot of the folks that we have seen with Donald Trump, um, with, with the Brexiteers, they are arguing that systems like the EU are so broken that all we can do is step away from them. But it's worth remembering that even before this sort of right populist wave, there actually was a left-wing wave of insurrectionism. Occupy Wall Street essentially said, look, so many aspects of our governance and financial system are broken we can't even give you a list of demands. What we want to do is model a different way of living, a way that is more cooperative, a way that is more participatory. That is the essence of an insurrectionist movement. We've seen some of those movements turn into political parties like Podemos in Spain, but that instinct of essentially saying the system just isn't working, let's try something very different, 
that is the spirit of insurrectionism that I was trying to understand. Now, there's a lot of different ways that you can react to insurrectionism. I talk about one class as radical institutionalists. These are not people who want to join an institution and make incremental change within it. These are people who want to tear down the institution from within and bring it back to its core values and strategies. There are counter Democrats. They are people who try to hold the institution responsible by pushing against it with different forms of public pressure. And then finally, there are the disruptors who are looking at an institution and saying, look, this one has to go so we can build something better in its place. So I look at the progressive prosecutors movement. I look at folks like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia who are going into the DA's office and saying, you know what? Our job should not be to figure out how to incarcerate as many people as possible. Our job is about justice for a community. And that may mean that we end up not prosecuting certain crimes. It may mean, as Krasner did, that we're going to put certain police on a do not call list and we're simply not gonna let them testify in cases, that we're going to functionally decriminalize uh, some aspects of society in the hopes of getting to the actual root of what it means to be a prosecutor, which is someone who is working on community justice. On the counter-Democrat side, I talk about movements like Monathon, which is this amazing project in Italy in which students are going out and auditing projects where EU money is being spent to try to see if they can find corruption. What they often find instead is that these projects are surprisingly good and surprisingly well designed. They come out as sort of outside pressure to try to hold people responsible they often find that those institutions work well. But counter-democracy works in other ways. The whole phenomenon of surveillance, of cop watching, of going out and watching the police, which I trace, by the way, back to the Black Panther movement, um, ends up essentially saying that we as citizens have a right to try to hold our very powerful institutions responsible. And while it's not in the book, I actually see the defund the police movement as possibly the best example that I've been able to, to see of what happens when people identify an institution that simply is not working for the communities anymore. In many communities, particularly communities of color, trust in the police is simply so low that looking at that institution and saying, can we step away from it? And can we figure out a different way to have security in its place has to be the way that we think these things through. This is a very practical book. Much of the book focuses on this idea from my friend Larry Lessig that there are four basic regulatory forces in society. We're all very used to this idea that we pass laws to regulate society. You can do that, you can't do that, or you go to prison. But Lessig argues that we regulate other ways as well. We use social norms. Um, people behave certain ways in a lecture. They behave certain ways in church. They behave certain ways when they're out in public. We use markets to make certain behaviors expensive or to make them cheap. Lessig's big breakthrough in 2000 is making the argument that sometimes we use technical architectures, we use code to make it possible to do things and to not do other things. My big trick here is to try to turn Lessig inside out and to basically say, we could use these four forces as levers. We can try to make change through law, but we can also make it through norms, through markets, and through code. So for instance, we know that under the Trump administration, we've had enormous backsliding on climate change and the legal environment has not been helping us deal with climate change. But we've seen market interventions, and Tesla's may be the silliest of them, but certainly the wave towards electric cars, the wave towards rooftop solar, the wave towards renewable energy, these are market-based approaches at a moment where law is stalled. Similarly, Edward Snowden raised a lot of our uh, visibility around issues of privacy. Uh, and in fact, we have very, very little privacy uh, under US law and under surveillance, but code interventions like Moxie Marling Spikes work on Signal and technology that later got incorporated into WhatsApp ends up creating private communication for a huge set of people.
Law remains incredibly powerful, but it's possible that the way that we make through change through law is shifting from the ways that it happened in the 1960s. So we can celebrate something like the Oberfelger decision and the fact that we now have equal marriage for LGBTQ TIA people, but we also have to recognize that law seems to have a different relationship than it used to, to norms. So here is a graph on people supporting interracial marriage. And you can see at the moment of Loving versus Virginia, there is very, very little popular support for interracial marriage. By the time that we get to Oberfelga, we are well within the majority of people believing that same-sex couples should be able to get married. So we had a moment in the 1950s and 1960s where we had Supreme Courts that were willing to push social change even when that change was not popular. We may now be at a moment where the courts are getting much closer to reflecting norm changes that have already happened, which means that having a norms change, Ellen DeGeneres becoming a, a celebrity superhero, uh, queer people on TV, that these norms-based theories of change may be enormously important. And in part because I'm trying to reach young audiences who often engage in social media activism, which tends to be focused on norms, I look a lot at campaigns like some of the campaigns around Michael Brown's death, where a young man started a hashtag campaign, if they gun me down, to offer this notion that the imagery used to represent Michael Brown was inappropriate and to basically hold the press responsible for not making victims look like thugs, but actually showing them uh, in the full diversity and the different light that they were within. This campaign ran for all of four days, made the New York Times radically changed how Mike Brown was portrayed. Even now today, if you go onto Google, he doesn't show up in that leftmost image, that image where he looks particularly tough, which was the image that dominated the news initially. Instead, you see Mike Brown as he was, which was a kid gunned down um, in, in violence um, by the police. So, at the end of the book, I find myself asking this question. Should we be institutionalists or insurrectionists? Should we be inside, outside of institutions? Should we build new ones? Which of these levers should we use? What I actually really care about in this book is efficacy. I really want the people who are reading the book and the people I'm reaching out to, to know that they can change the world. And the reason for that is that mistrust, the sort of mistrust that we saw weaponized bringing people into the Capitol on January 6th is fuel. You can use it as fuel for a movement to build new institutions, but it can burn things down. And so this moment of incredibly high institutional mistrust is both optimistic and terrifying. We can find ways to take all of this energy and channel it for change, but it's also fuel that if manipulated uh, could be incredibly destructive to the way that we see democracy right now. So that's a, a, a quick overview of all of this. It's really hard to cram almost 300 pages into 30 minutes. I know we have great questions coming up. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing and go back into normal Zoom mode. Thank you all for, for listening on that. And I would, I would love to have a conversation about this. David, I think you might be muted, which is fine for the people who are clapping, but it's harder for questions. I like the claps though. That's, I, my, my, my students are getting better at this too. I'm getting, I'm getting thumbs up at certain parts and lectures and such. I'm, uh, we're all fine. Sorry, my, on my screen was, my screen was locked. I am now unmuted, but I was locked. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ethan. So, we do not yet have a lot of questions in the chat or any questions in the chat, despite my urging. So um, if people want to raise their hands in the participant I, screen, I see a bunch of hands. questions, David. Oh, really? Yeah. You must have just come while I was locked up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see them. Sorry. OK, never mind. Um, I, my screen just locked. OK, so um, 
Where do we start? Do we start with you, Jamie? I think it looks like you have the first question. Yeah, I also have a one month old, so you're gonna hear some screaming a little bit. So I'm bouncing. Just yeah, that's... Jamie, like the bouncing has actually been getting me through the talk. I'm okay. Just... <laughs> I'm remembering when my son was was you know old enough to bounce, so I'm I am I am so enjoying it. And thank okay, you. I mean I did this in person when we were all in person, and I I felt like it was a little more easy to handle than watching a screen of someone bouncing. So I'm glad it's not making you nauseated. Um, so my question is, you know, this when you were talking about mistrust, I was hearkening back to my days studying under Laura Nader, who wrote about um, mistrust and depression and things related to dispute resolution mechanisms. So she has a project called Little Injustices. And she basically took Ralph Nader's complaint letters and studied them as a window into US society. What are people complaining about? Because that is a way to talk about the health of a society. And she compared our dispute resolution mechanisms here um, with the work that she had done in a Zapotec Mountain Village where dispute resolution was really done to restore harmony between the community. And it wasn't done in this sort of abstract rule-based way that really um, makes people feel even more disempowered and disconnected. And so I was thinking as you were presenting that part of the challenge I assume is also, we don't know what to do when we're upset about something that happens to us within these institutions. So sure, HMOs are one explanation, right? About what's going on in the medical system, but there's something else going on about our ability to resolve conflicts. Um, and you know what types of dispute resolution mechanisms we have um, and our inability to access courts, which she's really into. I'm much, we used to talk about that. I'm not, I don't think courts need to resolve everything, but there's, we don't have the ability to resolve our conflicts in the same way. So I'm wondering how that fits into your analysis um, and what the potentials are, especially when we see new forms of dispute resolution online and you know that may exacerbate our feelings of disconnection because we're disempowered, but could also maybe equalize power differentials if designed well. Yeah, Jamie, I mean, one, one thing that I would take in that example is that there's probably a difference between um, community dispute resolution where we're dealing with individuals. Um, sometimes individuals who are in a particular position of power um, but individuals rather than entities. Like I that was her main point also, is that most of our disputes now are with entities that we can't that's access. That's right. and, and, and I think there's something about, it, institutions are really complicated, right? So you need an institution because you need sustainability, you need neutrality, you need predictability, you need to be able to follow a set of rules. It shouldn't matter whether you're adjudicating something or I'm adjudicating something, the institution should have a rule book and it should be predictable in one fashion or another. The problem with that is that we end up dealing with something that doesn't have a face, that has an identity, but an identity that can be very hard for us to relate to, um, and something where you know we're judging based on iterated behavior as well as our personal interactions. And we're usually not even thinking about the institution until we're in a negative interaction with it. Um, so it's rare that we're sort of sitting there and saying, wow, I'm so grateful for this institution. It's doing a great job. There are exceptions, right? Watching in the UK, the enthusiasm for the National Health Service, there is an institution that has sort of found a way to have an identity to be celebrated in that fashion. But those institutions are pretty few and far between, at least in American life in one fashion or another. I think generally speaking, we all feel like if only I could be dealing with a person rather than dealing with the rule book, I would be in a better place on it. Where I would say, and again, you know, you're coming more from, from your work, I'm, I'm sort of coming from my work. I'm really interested right now in sort of my future work in trying to take some spaces that are very, very large and institutional, specifically social media, and turn it into much smaller communities and essentially say, look, we need you to take some of the governance responsibility for this space. We need you to become part of the mechanism that resolves disputes that sort of helps through it. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And because seeing how hard it is is likely to make you more sympathetic and more trusting of these institutions in the long time. That's in fact what I see in the monathon work is these students who have this natural sense of, oh my God, it's EU money, I'm sure it's corrupt. And, and then who actually sort of go out and go, oh, here are really smart people working really, really hard to build good things out there. 
uh, and then often sort of get involved uh, in that work of monitoring those institutions on the long term. Um, but maybe I am, I, I, I certainly would admit my own biases uh, are, are having to do with suspicions of institutions. I, I think where I hope the book can be helpful is that I think a lot of people are suspicious of institutions and trying to figure out how to offer something other than, look, grown up serious people understand that institutions are important and that's how we make change. Understanding that that isn't going to work for everybody, that's a big chunk of what I'm trying to do here. Thanks, Ethan. And um, Ethan, if you don't mind, I think we've got four questions that I see left in the chat. I'm going to ask, if it's okay, I'm going to ask people to ask all four questions in a row. Um, and maybe we'll have time for, you know, another round. We, we can try that. Absolutely. Let's I, try I, that if you don't I, mind. So we have in order um, our colleague in computer science, Nargis, uh, Matthew, Katie, um, and um, Elizabeth. Okay. Just go ahead with the questions and then Ethan will take a stab at them and hopefully we have some time for some more. Thank you so much. That was a great talk and really interesting analysis. So from where I'm coming and my background in computer science, uh, I do design and build community center tools to basically give voice to community members. But I also realize that there is a long road from empowering community to have a voice to really making and enacting change and collective actions. So my question is, what, what role can you imagine technology can play in terms of addressing inequality, uh, you know, power dynamic and enacting change? Yeah, so, so for people who don't know Nargis's work, um, it, it's brilliant and incredibly thoughtful and, and working on things like, um, town hall meetings and, and how could you um, involve technology so that people who are in the town hall meeting uh, could communicate their sentiments about various things being discussed uh, in the course of the meeting. And one of the things that I'm hoping to meet with Nargis about in the next couple of weeks is some of the new work that I'm doing on social networks uh, wants to focus on some of the same problems, trying to create social networks for a town around the specific governance of a town meeting so that that discussion can proceed and then follow the actual meeting itself and, and not just be involved with those hours. Um, Nargis, I think the big thing that I would say is that I think people need to have that first experience of efficacy. And I think you can build on that experience but I think there's almost um, a transformative moment between the sort of disengagement of I can't have any influence on this to the moment of engagement. And I think in some ways, you know, people often ask me on this book, well, isn't the solution just to go local, right? Go hyper local and you'll have a much better chance of efficacy and then you can sort of build your way up. And, and the answer is sure, sometimes, um, but there's also some local systems that are just as resistant to change as sort of massive national systems. The real question is where can you get traction and, and sort of move that first boulder? Um, I talk a little bit about um, the kids who survived the shootings at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School. And their first response was a very conventional civic response. They went to the Florida legislature to try to get heard um, to propose anti-gun uh, legislation. Not only would the legislators not meet with them, they actually used the opportunity to pass a bill um, prohibiting youth access to pornography uh, because we all know that pornography had ever so much to do uh, with that school shooting. Um, and so what they ended up doing was starting to pressure businesses. Uh, and you saw everyone from Delta Airlines, you know, uh, no longer providing an NRA discount to Dick's Sporting Goods and Walmart taking ammunition off the shelves. And so the funny thing is that moment of efficacy isn't always where you think it's going to be. Sometimes it might be an entity that you don't even think of as being a civic actor, like a, a national business chain. Um, so I think the biggest things that I'm looking for are trying to get people to use that very wide range of tools, many of which, as you noted, are technological, and then trying to help people have that first moment of efficacy and then sort of say, well, if I can change that, can I now take this energy and sort of bring it into another issue that I want to change? But I should say that, you know, 
th this this book is more vague hunches than it is sort of rule book for this is how it gets done. Um, I think the work that you are doing um, is enormously important and it's some that, that I am learning from. Um, but I think that moment of efficacy is the thing that we really have to aim for and work towards. Matthew, also from computer science, um, Katie and Elizabeth. And yeah, if you don't mind, Ethan, let's let them just barrel through the questions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, got have it. Another, yeah. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question was just about, you know, what we know, you know, sort of getting underneath some of those top line mistrust numbers. And specifically, like, I wonder how the sort of role of partisanship and is there and obviously there's a component you can't get around that those low numbers that there's general mistrust but then how much is well i mistrust the government more depending on this cycle versus last cycle maybe you know for these four years i'm an in institutionalist but uh, after next election i'm going to be an insurrectionist like is there a, a rotation that's going on here yeah absolutely we'll talk about that um, Katie, let's get a question from you and then I'll, I'll, and Elizabeth, and then we'll, we'll try to go through this. And I think you're muted. So it's actually kind of related to Matthew's question because he's asking about who's running the government and I'm asking about on whose behalf do people think the government's being run? Just looking at that drop in trust in the 60s and 70s when the federal government was at least publicly trying to do more things for African-Americans and then the bump up under Clinton with welfare reform and aggressive policing. And then apparently nothing Obama could do would get it above this low level. But believe me, there's lots to talk about on that. I, I, <laughs> let's, let's work on that. Elizabeth, let me take a question from you and let me see how I do with all three of these. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my question is a little bit more technical. It's just, you know, I feel like I grasped when you were talking about laws and norms, but I was wondering if you could give a few more examples about code. Sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. We can we can do that. So, um, so Matthew, let me let me sort of start with the detailed mistrust numbers. We actually do know quite about uh, quite a bit about them. Um, so the first thing is that, yes, absolutely, when your party is out of power, you trust the government less than you do when your party is in power. What's interesting about it is that it's not giant, like 30 or 40 point swings. It's like a 20 point swing. Um, and they tend to average out, right? So this is how you sort of end up with, um, you know, the low trust in government under Trump, for instance. Uh, you have essentially 0% trust from Democrats and you have like 40% trust from Republicans and you end up with an average of about 17. You can reverse the two sides of it and have the same thing on Obama. Um, one thing that's interesting is that you're starting to see some evidence that Republicans just don't trust anybody. Uh, and, and that may be um, an interesting sort of moment where I feel like the party in many ways has worked on the weaponization of mistrust and has sort of made that a central component of their political philosophy that may actually be very challenging to sort of undo. Um, let me just note a couple of other things. Um, people of color almost always have lower trust uh, than white people in the government. That makes perfect sense. Uh, it inverts briefly uh, during Obama uh, where there's a, a much higher African-American trust. It never uh, hits sort of stunningly high levels. Uh, I would argue that African-Americans in particular have had really, really good reasons uh, over many, many years to, uh, to mistrust the government. Um, Katie, you're absolutely right. One of the factors I talk about in chapter three of my book, when I talk about why trust falls is racism. Uh, and, and what you know, Ezra Klein has recently called uh, the drain swimming pool theory. Uh, look, if the government is going to directly benefit people of color, I don't trust them anymore because they're no longer acting in my benefit. And I think that's an absolutely reasonable um, theory to have uh, about what's going on with trust. Um, so, you know, Matthew, you also asked something about um, institutionalism. We did see this wave of enthusiasm for institutions from the Dems under Trump. We saw this crazy moment where you would see people coming from the left 
um, who would essentially say, um, you know, I, I'm all for the FBI, which is not something that you expect most leftists to end up sort of saying. Um, so there is this sense of if we have someone who truly does seem to be smashing institutions, and let me say, my insurrectionists are not just about smashing them, they're, they're about replacing them with something that works. If you have someone in who's just a wrecking crew, it may make perfect sense to be an institutionalist just because the institutions are the only things that hold us together. What we actually have to be very cautious about at the moment in this sort of Biden moment is that these institutions were not working well for us even under Obama, right? Occupy happens under Obama. There are very reasonable social critiques that talk about inequality, that talk about services not functioning, that talk about the lack of healthcare, that talk about racism in the police force that are not going to be restored just by having a conventional person in the White House. Uh, and so that's one of the big messages that I wanna take out of this. Elizabeth, when Lessig talks about code, he's really talking about the ways in which technology can make some things possible and make other things impossible. Um, so one of the, the very elegant examples of this is that curb cuts in sideways are uh, in sidewalks is, is a code-based intervention. Until you have a curb cut, that curb is a barrier for someone in a wheelchair, someone pushing a baby stroller. It is a small technological change that suddenly makes a behavior possible, whereas previously it was impossible. Lessig's really worried about barriers within technology. Um, so one of the classic examples here is in the old days when we had CDs and DVDs, if you put a CD into your computer, your computer would say, hey, that's a CD, let me make a copy for you. You'd put in a DVD and your computer would lock the systems down and say, no matter what, you cannot make a copy of this without lots and lots of shady software to sort of do this. That is a code-based system making a behavior possible and preventing other behaviors from happening. Um, as far as what code is sort of making possible, as far as actual change in the world today, um, this is a lot of what people are trying to do right now when they're trying to do things like fix political polarization by introducing you to people that you otherwise wouldn't interact with on Facebook. Um, is this the right way to fix that problem? Probably not, um, but code-based changes are really appealing because if you can do them once, you can then essentially have impact on enormous scale. Um, so when someone sort of says, I'm gonna build an AI system to detect hate speech and I'm gonna pull it off of Twitter, that's an attempt at a code-based intervention with the idea that it's infinitely scalable. And I hope that that helps sort of understand how I'm, how I'm using the term there. Uh, David, you suggested we might we might have time for another question or two. Is that possible? Yeah, I think we do. Um, and I, I noticed that my colleague Viviana has a couple of questions. I also know that you're one to reach young people and there are students here. So I am wondering if there's any students who want to pose a question. Um, and while you're thinking about it, how about if it's OK with you, Viviana, if you just would ask one of your two questions for now? Sure. Um, um, thanks thank so much. Yeah, um, I think um, I make a comment and a question. So thank you so much, Even. It is just fascinating. And I'm wondering, um, one of the mistrust uh, could also be contributed by the diverse norms that people are sharing. So actually, one of the institution, which is the norm, is actually is problematic right now, right? <laughs> so um, that really goes to Jamie's point on conflict resolution, which I also have a passion on. But my question really is, I felt like, um, like, as I'm from Hong Kong, I'm always thinking about like whether it's a successful like movement uh, in, in Hong Kong because after uh, the strong and powerful role of civil society and hoping to you know uh, push forward some democratic democratic ideals, it actually met with like like democratic backsliding and more repressive from the other end, right? So I 
like think, uh, listening to your 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 sharing let me think about like maybe I could like think about the two category of insurrectionist and institutionalist right I felt like the movement uh, people are driving is really to you know change institution they may even like <laughs> um, really try to get the legislature to help but they don't they don't and hence they are trying to change it but that later met with more like yeah. control and power. So my 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 personal question really is to uh, definitely have to finish your book <laughs> and to know your personal take about what's next, right? After this true approach, if they work or if they fail. Thank you yeah. so much. So Viviana, that that notion of diverse norms and norm conflicts is really smart, and I want to do some more thinking about that. I think that's absolutely right. And I think we see those conflicting norms in a lot of online spaces in particular. Um, one of the things that I talk about in some of my work on reforming social media is trying to make the norms of a space more explicit so that we don't end up in conflict without really knowing it. I follow the situation in Hong Kong pretty closely. I have friends who are educators in Hong Kong. Uh, I have a good friend who supported his students in the protests, participated in the protests, and lost his job. And I think one of the things that you'll see with institutions is that they move to protect themselves. And one of the ways that they move to protect themselves is by pushing insurrectionists outside and essentially saying, I'm not going to let you change the institution from within. I'm going to try to disempower you to the, the place where you don't have that ability for change. One of the things that's really hard about insurrection is that it isn't just enough to have an idea for a better system. You actually have to have power to try to figure out how to disengage the people who benefit from the existing system. And this is why insurrection in some ways is so much easier in like the business world. Let's disrupt this industry. The market is actually sort of set up to have you disrupt. But governments in particular really don't like being disrupted. Uh, and they will often react in a way that essentially says we're going to shut down that ability. David, did you want to try one more? Yeah, I noticed that uh, Arleth has her hand. Um, please, up. yeah, go ahead, Arleth. Please go ahead. Just to uh, answer, if you didn't get a question out, please tweet at me. Tweet at Ethan Z, and I'm, I'm happy to try to do it that way as well. Arleth, please go ahead. I had a question about uh, the Senate impeachment trials, and do you think that kind of what's the effect of um, of that against the argument to try to gain trust with the government? Because I know a lot of people were kind of um, they didn't. I mean, it could have been both ways, but now we know the result. So I just wanted to hear, to hear your opinion. So I am very afraid that what the two impeachment trials during the Trump administration have done is um, decreased our trust in impeachment as a way of holding a chief executive responsible. And I think what we are discovering is that some guardrails that we thought were in place are actually not especially functional. And I think we see impeachment as a guardrail on presidential behavior. And it turns out that norms were a much stronger guardrail um, than the actual process of impeachment. One of the things that worries me a great deal is that I think a message that you can take from this is as long as you have you know, 30 or 40 senators, you're gonna be just fine. And it's very, very hard um, to dislodge something uh, in the way the Senate is currently structured. You know, I offer a pretty radical proposal for House of Representatives reform and electoral college reform in the book. I end up uh, proposing that we go back to George Washington's 30,000 representatives to uh, 30,000 citizens to one representative, which would give us a house of 11,000 representatives meeting virtually and would uh, make the electoral college essentially irrelevant because it becomes a popular vote at that point. But I don't know how to fix Cong I don't know how to fix the Senate and I don't know how to fix Congress and, and I find it dispiriting, but I think it makes it even more important that we think about these moments where people can sort of say, look, if we can't fix this within the institutions that are slated to sort of fix these things, what are problems that we can fix? And are they ones where we work within the system or occasionally we see that the, the system really needs a radical overhaul? Thanks. And on that, actually pretty upbeat note, considering, you know, the question, um, 
I want to thank everybody for being here. I encourage you to come next month for a similarly, you know, big book stimulating talk uh, and, you know, to take care of yourselves and each other in the meantime. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who came out. This is just a wonderful uh, way to share these ideas. And I'm, I'm just so excited and happy to be part of this community. Um, thank you all for, for the support and the enthusiasm here. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.